so uh, moving on to our next session. Uh, this is going to take you through the case of uh, MH17. This is uh, probably one of the biggest investigations that we've done at Bellingcat. Um, so I'm going to take you through it step by step. We'll have a special guest part of the way through. It's not Donald Trump, I'm afraid, but uh, hopefully it'll be nearly as good. Um, so I'm going to start with what happened on the day. So moments after MH17 was shot down, we immediately had this kind of surge on social media of people finding information, sharing it. A lot of it was rubbish, but we needed to figure out what was good information and what wasn't. So um, one of the first things we started seeing are photographs and videos of a uh, Buck missile launcher being transported on a truck. And over the weeks and months that followed, more images appeared. Um, and from that, we can actually build up a route of where this missile launcher had been. So what we have here is uh, the first photograph that was taken of the missile launcher on the day. But... How do we know that's the case? Well, there's various interesting things in this uh, image. For example, the phone number that's visible here. Now, as all good open source investigators should do, as soon as you see a number on something that's interesting, type it into the internet and see what happens. And in this case, we came across this website. And this is for a vehicle yard, uh, a rental firm that's uh, in the ta ta uh, city of Donetsk, which was separatist controlled at the time. And we know that because we have this, which gives us the full address. And we're actually able to find that place on Google Earth. And we can zoom into the exact location. And we can see the vehicle yard. And what we can even do is go to the street view imagery and see the phone number on the building outside. And we can see that it matches to the vehicle and confirm it's the phone number from that vehicle yard. So we can already see there's a very strong chance that this is somehow related to each other. Now, the next video was this one, which again shows a truck transporting what looks like a large piece of military equipment. Um, so this one was a lot easier to geolocate because the person who uh, posted it online also gave us the full coordinates of where it was posted. Um, the problem was we don't just trust stuff because it's on the internet. But again, it's a string of numbers, so we chuck that into the internet, see what comes up, and it gives us this location in a town called Zores, which is east of Donetsk. Now, uh, we want to verify this, so what we're able to do is start comparing the various things. Now, we do the old colored boxes on items that we do with geolocation. So we have this uh, structure on top of one of the buildings we can see. We can also see... Uh, this structure on the ground. We can see the that shadow being cast by this post, for example. The paths are the same. There's all these details that allow us to match it quite easily and quickly. So we've established um, two locations. So now what we're going to do is move back to the vehicle yard we were in in Donetsk. And this time what um, someone did is they decided they would automatically calculate the route between this location and the next location and then switch to Street View and then what he did is he pointed the camera down the road and started virtually driving down it to see if he could find a match for the photograph. And eventually that person did. And I'm extremely glad to say that wasn't me. Um, but it was an area just east of uh, that vehicle yard. Um, what was interesting here is this, uh, these signs. Because we could start taking these signs and comparing the details and the structures that were visible. So straight away, we could start seeing things uh, that matched in the image. And we started matching them off. So again, we whip out the color boxes. We can see that's a match, that's a match, and this is a match. But there was one thing that was made it very clear it was the same location. And it was the branches and the leaves in the background, which were almost identical. And if you look really carefully and you look at every individual branch, as I did, and every little twig, you can actually see they're all in the same position. So we can be certain this is the same location. So um, there's a third location, and my special guest is Eric Toller from Bellingcat, who um, this is actually, this geolocation is how I um, first got to know Eric. Um, so take it away, Eric. Yeah. yeah. So this is, you saw this picture earlier with the um, table game, with the first geolocation table game. So this will be a little bit familiar to you. So right here you see the Buk missile launcher again. We spin, it's made its journey from Donetsk that morning, then it went through uh, Zugres, and now it's in Tarez, in a city in eastern Ukraine. Here it is, the 
Buk missile launcher that shot down MiG-17 with the truck with the phone number on the side. Um, and the, remember the Jeep, that's important later on, so keep that file out away for about 15 minutes from now, following by a UAS-469 Jeep. And so where is this located? When this is first came out, it was reported that it was in Snezhnoya, or Snezhny in Ukrainian, which is a town actually about five kilometers or east of Therese. And so a lot of times when we do these workshops, it a lot of, you know, really cool examples of all this cool geolocation and research and all that stuff. But journalists, of course, as we talked about earlier, editors are very concerned with deadlines and quantity and getting your stories done. Maybe you have to do three, four stories a day of filing. You don't have time to do all this super, super complex geolocation and research and verification. But here's an example of how you can very quickly, within five, ten minutes if you get good at it, can verify where this stuff is taken so you actually know with this video or photo that you share on a tweet or social media or in your story is actually from there, not something recycled from the Georgian War or something like that. So the Russian speakers and the audience might recognize this place. Um, Dom is the second word in green, and the first one, you can see a section of it. It's Stroy Dom, which is a, like a construction hardware materials shop. Well, search for the address of all the Stroy Dom stores in the area in eastern Ukraine. There's not very many, two or three, and one of them is in Therese. Here's magazine Stroy Dom in um, Therese. And on this street of, what is it, this 50 years of the USSR street. Okay, and also if you want to double verify it, you can even s double verify the exact address. And here's an old court proceeding about um, a story of someone who lived in the same building as that Stroy Dome store. As a, they got into an argument or something and the legal documents listed the, ad the exact address. Not just the street, which is on this wiki map, or the cyclowiki.org just gave the street, but not the actual house number. Here you can get the house number, get the exact address. Okay, well, don't trust my word. There's no Google Street View or Yandex Street View for Therese. But we have the next best, next best thing. I'll show that to you in a minute. So for some of the features on here, you have the Stroy Dome like we talked about. But we also have this house next to it, the two vertical stripes, very unusual stripes on the side of the house. Well, if you go on to YouTube, there's a whole bunch of Russians and Ukrainians, almost always Russians and Ukrainians, who have the registrator, the dash cam video, right? So these dash cam videos, see bears across the street, the comets in the air, meteorites, right? And also you have kind of your own personal Google Street View for each town and village in Russia and Ukraine. So a lot of these places don't have coverage in Google Maps or Yandex Street View. But you do have a bunch of people, even with the timestamp, right? This is in 2012. You can see over time how these places change. So you have the next best thing. You have uh, live videos that are on YouTube. Just type in the city, maybe the address you're looking for, and you can find all these people have uploaded these videos. So they're driving around town. They even list in, in super detail like, the route they take. Sometimes they drive between towns. It's three, four hours long videos. It's just as good as Google Street View. And you see right there, the building of the stripes. And from the same guy, coming from the other angle. Is this going to play? Oh, there it goes, okay. And here, the intersection coming from the other side on the left, you can see Stroy Dome lit up in neon and the building with the vertical stripes. So with that, we can see videos from both sides. And here you combine them and it's a fancy video here and you can actually see this is where it was taken. And it was first reported this was taken in Snezhnoye, like I mentioned earlier, which is about five kilometers so east of Therese. And a lot of, on the day of the downing, a lot of people were reporting this was taken in a different town. But if they had done this five, ten minute process, they would have seen, no, it actually, not only is it here, but a lot of reporters from the AP and BuzzFeed and elsewhere and The Guardian, they went to this exact spot, talked to some people at a cafe nearby, because they now they know exactly where the photo was taken. They talked to witnesses and then got people saying, oh, yeah, around lunchtime, you know, we heard this vehicle had sirens on it. We saw them drive by. So then now you have sources for your story because you found the exact address. You did that five to minute geolocation process. And here it is. And you can even figure out the time it was taken. So you can compare the shadows. If you look on here, you can see the shadows that are casted. There's a tree. If you look really closely, the shadow right in front of the photographer is a tree. So you know there's a tree behind the guys. That can help your geolocation too. And you see there's a few other cat shadows casted. And there's a really cool tool called SunCalc. SunCalc.net or SunCalc.org. They're the same site more or less. And with this, you can put in the day that the photo was taken. And it could figure out the azimuth of the 
you know, the angle of the sun with all the historical data and astro astronomical data. And if you put the approximate direction that a shadow was cast at the time, you can find out, not to the minute, but within 15, 30 minutes when the photo was taken. So if we had seen this video right here, if it would actually have been taken at 5 p.m. or at 8 a.m., it does not fit our timeline because the book was in Donetsk around 9, 10 a.m., and it fired the missile around 4, at 4.20 p.m. So if this was at 5 p.m. or 8 a.m., it throws everything out the window because it means this photo is old or some information we know is wrong. But if it's the timeline perfectly, this is exactly the same time. It, this is around 12, 15, 12, 12, 15, which is when a lot of reports coming in from Twitter of locals in Therese were talking about this book going down that exact street that we saw. So it's not just one piece of information. We triangulate from different pieces of information. Um, and here, again, this is the street. It's on one highway all the way from Donetsk. It took a little detour all the way through. So it fits, again, that information as well, along N21 or H21 in English. 35 miles, and here it is, the street that it went along. Afterwards, um, Ella, do you want to do this part, or do you want me to go through? Okay. So um, there was a sighting later, uh, further east still, and this time we had a photograph and a video. Now, this time the missile launcher is moving under its own speed. Um, it's no longer mounted on the truck. The first one was quite easy to lo geolocate, so I'll spare you that, but Again, we had people go out there who took photographs that demonstrated it was exactly the same location. Um, with this video, um, I cheated. I just asked people on Twitter where they thought it was, and I had 10 people point me to the same location. Uh, of course, I double-checked that. So here's the photograph location, and just to the east of that uh, was this street, where you have these uh, two roads with a line of trees down the middle. And it's surrounded by apartment buildings, so it doesn't quite match. But if we go south out of the area, we can start seeing a closer match. And this red roof building is particularly interesting because if we watch the video, we can actually see there's a building in it that has a red roof. Now, that isn't completely conclusive, so we start looking at other little details. So we start looking at the roads that are around it because we can see a road just to the north. It heads to the west where it meets these two lanes. There's a tree just south of it. it and then there's another road just south of that. So there's one tree in between two roads. So we go back to the video and we have a look if we can see that. And in fact, if we look carefully, we can actually see there's two roads and a tree in between them. So we can also see it's film from a high position. So we look at the top of the road and we in fact see a set of apartment buildings. So the position of the camera is also important in understanding where stuff is filmed. So we can actually compare this to the view from the um, video, and we can actually see that the views are actually pretty similar. And once we've done that, we can start looking at all these rooftops and see if they actually line up with what's visible. So we've taken this whole journey now. We've seen it south coming out of this town. We started way over in the west in Donetsk, and then we've headed all the way over to the east, where we see it finally heading under its own speed south out of the town. But there were other things we were discovering as well. At, once we found these videos and photographs of this path, we started digging through social media for people who had seen it and posted about it. Because um, there's a big difference between, say, Ukraine and Syria. In Syria, in opposition-held areas, you have very restricted internet. In Ukraine, people are just posting all sorts of rubbish. So you have to sort through that rubbish. And you find posts like this. So this is a translation of a post. This, as far as we figured out, I believe, is the first sighting of that missile launcher. Um, and it's describing that missile launcher coming down a highway into Donetsk before it leaves. And it's in a convoy. It has a uh, convoy with a RAV-4, a camouflage UAZ, which is kind of a military vehicle, which you saw in the photograph earlier, and a uh, blue van. Um, they get the make wrong. Um, and we know that because we actually had another video appear, I think around two years later, of the missile launcher in a convoy. And this is very interesting because straight away you can see the vehicles described in the convoy. You can see the missile launcher again. Uh, you can see the UAZ behind it and the van. Now, we wanted to verify where this was taken and where it was, um, what time it was taken, and a minor miracle occurred. First of all, um, one thing we discovered is searching for all the videos of convoys is that the same exact vehicles were in a separatist convoy two days earlier. So we knew they were in the area, we knew these number plates were the same and all the other details, but how do you know if this um, video was actually taken on July 17th? Well, there's a petrol station in the uh, video. And what you can do 
um, is go to the petrol web station's website. And there's these websites that archive web pages. You may have seen them. Sometimes you know you might see a, tr a tweet Donald Trump's deleted, and you want to find it, and you go to archive.org um, and double check it really said what you thought it said. Um, but what we can do with this, we can go to the website of this petrol station, and it has all the fuel prices. And then we just simply tick off the list and compare them and make sure they're the same. So that's a fairly good indication it's around the same date. But how can we be really sure? Well, this is where the miracle happened. Um, the exact moment this truck was in this convoy, uh, a satellite was over the area and took a photograph and captured it on the roads within minutes of that video being filmed. The odds of that are very, very low, and it birthed various conspiracy theories, but it can happen. And you can actually see other vehicles that are visible in that convoy in the kind of uh, appropriate positions. I mean, we can't say exactly which vehicles they are, but they're in where they should be. Uh, we can interestingly see details like this. The shadows cast by the larger vehicle on the back of that truck is longer than the shadow cast by the smaller vehicles. So we know there's something large on that truck that is approximately the right shape. And we can also look at the petrol station and see the cars in the video in the correct positions on the satellite imagery. So all these little details tell us that it must be July 17th. So now we've tracked this missile launcher through the area, we have other details. So the launch site, we wanted to figure out where this missile came from, and this photograph uh, was the first clue. Now, uh, this was a very controversial photograph when it was published because it appeared to be very light blue, uh, the sky seemed clear, and everyone knew that it was a dark, cloudy day when MH17 was shot down. But what had happened is the person who had shared it had decided they would lighten the image to make it easier to see um, beforehand, uh, as the smoke was very faint, but we were able to contact the person who took the photograph. And not only did he take this photograph, but he took a, a second photograph where, in fact, you can barely see the smoke, but it's just about there. Um, so we actually received the original raw files for both these photographs from the camera, and the date and the time matched the moment of the launch. Again, we were able to geolocate this, and we could zoom into the person's uh, balcony uh, in this area. So we had the precise location this photograph was taken from on this balcony of this building. And then what we could do is follow the line and the direction of the smoke. And we want to see if there's anything interesting there. And indeed, there was. There was this field, which had a very unusual pattern of plowing. And it was just south of the last location we'd seen the missile launcher. You can see the red roof clearly there. So we decided to have a look into this field. Now, this is what the field looks like shortly after MH17 was shot down. And it was possible to get satellite imagery from before, on July 16th, and on July 21st. So what you're seeing is that the day before MH17 shot down, this field was not plowed. And journalists went out there. They spoke to local people. One of the local farmers says his field was on fire on July 17th for some reason, and they had to plow it to stop the fire spreading. Uh, in fact, just on the right-hand side of the photograph, you can see a separatist checkpoint that was there. So it was definitely in separatist territory, and it had this very unusual uh, plowing on it on July 17th, and witnesses uh, who said it was on fire. Now. The Joint Investigation Team gave a press conference on September 28, 2016, where they presented some additional evidence of what had happened. So they had this photograph, which they said they found on social media. So immediately, all the people who'd been looking for this stuff on social media were very jealous. But it actually shows the same smoke trail from a different direction. So what we're then able to do, we could also geolocate this as the Joint Investigation Team is, did, and it could be seen clearly to be coming from the same field. But there was other evidence that was presented. For example, this image from the US government. Now, this is uh, a terrible image. It's really unclear. Uh, it's really hard to see where that little green line begins. So we were trying desperately for weeks and weeks and weeks to figure out exactly where this was taken. So what we figured out is if you draw lines, which you can just about see there, it's rather faint, between the various um, large landmarks, and you have it intersect the start of that green point, you can do the same thing on Google Earth. And we did this from multiple um, angles and perspectives, but always intersecting that green, the start of that green line and always through large landmarks that we could easily identify. And when you zoom in, this is what you get. It's the same field. So they seemed to verify that the US information that had been provided was, in fact, correct. 
Um, it was just very badly presented, so it took us to, I think it was October that year, it took us to uh, figure it out, and it was released in July. Now, we are also, again, search social media. So just looking for people in the local area who made mentions of anything that sounded interesting. So, for example, someone said that a Mitt rocket had buzzed up. And we looked at these social media accounts and we saw their kind of day-to-day -day activity and figured out, in many occasions, approximately where they lived. So some of them said they saw the missile or the smoke coming from a certain direction. And in all these examples, it pointed towards that same location. And in fact, the joint investigation team, when they um, released their September 28th um, update, they had said they had spoken to multiple um, witnesses on the ground who had also seen these launches coming from that direction. Some had seen the rocket, some had seen the plane being uh, crashing, and other details like that. And it always pointed to the same location. So we had confirmed the route of the missile launcher with open source information. We also had the launch site of the missile, and we knew it was under separatist control. Then we had the next day, and this video, which was filmed on July 18th, um, early morning, and what we're seeing again is our friend the truck, and we're seeing now the missile launch on it has one missile missing. So we can compare it to the truck that we saw earlier, and we can see it looks like the same vehicle. So now we've gone from the west, we've traveled all the way to the east, we've launched the missile, and now we're over in Luhansk, according to the people who uploaded it. Uh, the thing is, the people who uploaded it were the Ukrainian uh, Ministry of Interior. So again, we need to double-check this information. And they did, did give exact coordinates, but we want to verify this independently. So there was a few things we did. Um, some people came along this website, which are the traffic cameras in Luhansk. And they had been left on for quite a while. The um, only problem it was they'd been turned off a week beforehand by the local separatists because people were watching all the videos and watching all the military vehicles drive in and out of Ukraine. Um, but what they didn't do is remove the preview Im imageries. Now, all these images are being generated from four JPEGs. Those four JPEGs are the preview image from the camera, and once the cameras were turned off, they just kept that, say, the last image on there. And this camera showed the exact intersection that this missile launcher was claimed to be on. So we could look um, at the web page, we could find the JPEG image that was feeding this image, and we actually had quite a nice look at the uh, intersection. And we can always already see a match here. We can see this uh, vehicle here on the billboard. It looks very similar, but billboards are not always you know, unique, as we well know. So we had to look at other details. So if we zoom out, we can actually use uh, Yandex Maps, has its own version of Street View, similar to Google Street View, um, but it covers places like Ukraine, and we can actually plonk the camera right on the road where that Buck missile launcher was and see what was behind it. And we can get a little bit close to have a nicer view and then compare it to what was visible there. So we can see that this uh, red roof is the same. We can see the position of this silver roof is the same, the chimney's in the same position. And then this other roof, uh, silver roof with a white wall. They're all in the same position. So immediately we start seeing more and more matches. So before I talked about the position of the camera with the video where we could see it was high up in an apartment. Well, in this one, we can see at the start of the video a window frame. And we can see it's overlooking some trees towards the intersection. And if you actually look at the area in question, you can see the apartment buildings uh, on the left-hand side. And they're overlooking trees towards that intersection and we can safely say that the position of the uh, camera is pointing in this direction. So um, people are looking into this, and locals just went out and got their cameras and started taking photographs and sharing them on various websites. So these were found on a, a live journal website. So we have, for example, a nice close-up of this uh, poll, and the reason that's important is because in the video you can actually just make out, it's very blurry, but you can see um, the various things that are attached to this pole. And they just happen to have a almost identical shape, as blurry as they are. You can look at things, for example, like the um, uh, curb and see the position of everything there is very similar. And we're a good look at the billboard. Now, um, we had the missile launcher as it was uh, after the missile launch, but people started becoming interesting about it before. Where was it before? Where did it come from? So what we were able to do is lots of people on social media, all kinds of websites were hunting for every video they could find on social media of missile launches. So for example, we had all these um, videos, uh, just a tiny selection of what was available, some in Ukraine, some inside Russia, 
And there was one in particular that was very interesting. Because this is one of these strange little random things that happen when you uh, spend too much time on social media. Um, someone pointed out that this missile launch had some very interesting markings. Because if we think back to that first photograph, there are markings on the side of that photograph. And we decided we would try and, uh, using our imagery expert, flatten this image and then overlay the other image with it and start seeing if the patterns were in the same, si same areas. And it happened they were almost identical. The number, although it had been painted over, the remains of it was in the same location. The loading marking that's here were also in the same location. A burn mark on the exhaust was in the same location. And we discovered something else. The rubber side skirt above the tracks uh, over time, it gets damaged in a very particular way. And it creates a kind of unique fingerprint. So we've decided to basically draw a line on both of those um, tracks. And we discovered that they look very similar. But unfortunately, there's one area that looked different. Now, these were only taken a few weeks apart. These side skirts are very tough. So if it was different, there was probably going to be two answers. Either it was a different side skirt, or because we had flattened the two-dimensional image, if there was a three-dimensional piece of damage that was very significant, then that would not be correctly reflected. And fortunately, we found this photograph and other videos of the same missile launcher inside Russia, where we could have a nice close look at the side skirt, and we could see in exactly the correct position there was that very significant piece of three-dimensional damage that would not have been accounted for. So this further confirmed it was the same uh, one. Now, we didn't just take one side skirt and um, just leave it there. We looked at as many as we could possibly taste, uh, test. We looked at all the different markings to see if they were in the same position in the same way. And there was only one missile launcher that had anywhere near the same number of markings in the same position, and only one with the same uh, damage to the rubber side skirt in the same way. Now, uh, going back to the um, September 28th press conference of the joint investigation team, there was a very interesting video published. Now, this is being blurred out to stop anyone geolocating it. And this was uh, provided by a witness to the joint investigation team. And it's another video of the military convoy. And when we saw this, we got extremely excited. Uh, can anyone guess why? It's because we're weird. No, it's because it's the, it shows for the first time in uh, Ukraine the other side of the missile launcher. We hadn't seen that before. But in, in Russia, we had seen it. So this video shows the other side. So even though it judges about a lot, it gave us a fairly good clean view. And straight away, we could start seeing the various marks that were in similar locations. And there's many more. I think there's at least three or four more that we discovered as we were looking very carefully at this image. Now, the funny thing is, although that video has been blurred out by the joint investigation team to stop anyone geolocating it, some people have claimed they've been able to do it with the gaps in between all the tires and the wheels. So even though something might not look like it can be geolocated, it often can. So what we had next was a root of this missile launcher. We geolocated all these videos, and we started tracing it, the convoy it was in, back to its point of origin. So we moved all the way up to the point of origin in Kursk. And we started thinking of how we could figure out who this actually belonged to. Now, in the video, we can see interesting details. For example, the number plate. And the number plate ends with 50, which pointed to the Moscow military district. We looked at Moscow mili the military district. There's various resources online because you have lots of people documenting this stuff just for fun and hobbies. Weirdos. Um, and then we um, found uh, that this truck came from the 53rd Air Defense Brigade because they were the only ones who had the Buck missile systems. And the 53rd Air Defense Brigade, they have a social media page. And the soldiers of the 53rd Brigade follow that social media page. And this is one of them. And he actually uh, was the driver in 2013, not 2014, I will say, of the same truck because he posted a photograph of himself inside it and outside it multiple times. Now, we started searching through the social media networks of all these soldiers, basically looking at their friends, their friends' friends, anyone who's commenting on the posts. Um, this is a piece of research that took around a year. So we dug through all the social media posts of the soldiers to figure out who was a soldier, who was in the 53rd Brigade. And they would post things like this. This is an attendance record for their unit. So they took a photograph of it and posted it on Instagram. 
So we then had a list of names that we could look for on social media and that we knew would be linked to their unit. We were then able to uh, look at other things, for example, their posts that they were putting on social media. And they were also putting even photographs of themselves in the convoy. And they were tagging each other so we could click on the tags and know that they were their friends. Uh, these are people in the 53rd Air Defence Brigade in 2014, so we have censored their names and faces. Um, this is one of my favourites. Uh, we've censored these faces, but the guy behind them in the middle is fast asleep. And one of the videos of the convoy, you can actually see him fast asleep on the same day uh, in the background. So they got there and they started. To, they got to where their, their destination, and that's the local town. And they stood out the town sign and they took a photograph of it. We geolocated that as well, just to be sure. Um, but they gave their location away, um, and they started posting things like this, which were the um, certificates they received for being on exercise during that period. So we knew they were up to something at that period. Um, and we also had the uh, wife's girlfriends and mothers. Uh, of the family, uh, the soldiers posting about what they were doing. Uh, so saying they were very worried that their you know, husband had gone to the Ukrainian border uh, to do training and it was very dangerous out there. So based on all that information, we were able to piece together um, the entire 53rd Brigade's uh, second division, which was the division that was in the convoy based off purely their social media posts. And these are the people who are the commanders of the Buck missile launchers and support units that were in that convoy. And we were able to get nearly all their names and faces, all the open source information behind that, and provide that to the official criminal investigation so they could make their own analysis of the information. Because one of the beauty about open source information is you can collect this information, you can do your own analysis. But if you want to share it with someone, especially if, say, you know, a criminal investigation, they can look at the evidence. It's all open source. It's not something you've gathered from you know, a witness. It's just out there. So they can recreate your investigation and find things like the 53rd uh, Anti-Aircraft Missile Brigade. Um, and I think it's just been announced in the last couple of days that they're now looking to have a Dutch court uh, prosecute in the MH17 case. Um, and um, that is where we'll leave it for today. So uh, I think we've got time for questions, have we? Okay, so we'll um, get some... Is there any questions? I'll get mics. Or did I answer all your questions for you? Anyone? Sure, have you got a mic? Oh, okay, just, just, I'll just do one, yeah. Uh, so I'm just curious, because probably with this MH17 um, investigation, you were mainly looking into like the contact uh, mm -hmm. uh, social networks. Is it more difficult with, for example, Facebook, because their algorithm for searching within networks are a bit more difficult, or, or no um, difference? Like actually not, because I, I, we recently did a workshop, and a guy called Hank Vaness went there. Um, and he's uh, someone who um, teaches how to do social media searches on Facebook. And it honestly, was terrifying how much stuff he was showing us. Yeah, I think he, he has this tool called Graph Tips, right? Yeah, yeah he. Just the, the, I think you can do a lot more on Facebook than most people realize. I certainly more than I could realize. Uh, yeah, it, for example, there. removes metadata, right? And well, yeah, this is one thing with uh, BK because they do have a lot of geotagged photographs. When we're looking at Russian soldiers in camps. Um, inside Russia, often you'd have one person posting a geotag photograph and it would show all the other people in the area. And if it's a military camp, it's a load of soldiers. So you can get a really good sense of who's, who's in there. Okay, so yeah, it's optimistic for the Western world and well, Facebook, it, right? it depends because um, with Facebook, the biggest thing with Contactia and Facebook is on Facebook, a lot of the default privacy settings are a lot higher than for Contactia because on Contactia, your default privacy settings are like nil for the most part. But on Facebook, people are a lot more mindful of hiding information and keeping them within the networks, right? So you have to be from a certain town or college or whatever to view networks. On contact, it's not, I mean, you can do that, but people don't do it as much. So the big um, difference to me is with Facebook and contact is that people are much more mindful of privacy settings and Facebook does more to promote um, updating your privacy settings and all that stuff. But on contact, it's, it's free for all for the most part. I mean, you can put things in private, right? But for the most part, people don't. And there are, um, if there's, you know, there are more open groups on Facebook compared to um, Facebook. Um, yeah, but then you also have like on the Klasniki, which is another Russian language social network to where 
again, things are very open, but um, you can't be a voyeur as well because they get a little notification saying someone from Germany has just viewed your profile. And so if you see a bunch of people from the U.S. and the Netherlands um, viewing your profile and you're a Russian soldier, you get a little bit paranoid probably. And then you reduce your information. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Um, get the mic. So I think this one down there. You first, and then we'll go to you. Okay. So I just wanted to follow up on what you said. Um, have you received any feedback on, uh, especially from the soldiers or from from Russia, uh, in in what you you know revealed their names, their faces, obviously, um, a, because when I bust some you know fake propaganda websites or, or people there, um, I get lots of, uh, so to speak, fan mail with, uh, you know, hate speeches and, and, and homoerotic messages and such. So, you know, have you received anything like that? Um, some, but it's, it's not, it doesn't seem like it's been from the soldiers themselves. Um, I, mean, do you, I mean, fortunately, some people, people figured out these identities themselves and immediately started posting abuse in the 53rd Air Defense Brigade uh, went website is not you know a nice read anymore after yeah. we revealed the missile launcher came from them i mean we, we were able to do this to the point where we could say the exact number of the missile launcher that shot down mh17 from these details but um uh i mean we haven't had too much trouble have we no not too much i mean we get like elliot's talking about this morning about the minute like lavrov crashed us the minister russian foreign minister so we get it from the high rather than the low but like he mentioned we tried to because with the 53rd i mean we blur their face and all that stuff because I mean, most of these guys are just like 21, 22-year-old kids, and they didn't do anything wrong, right? 99% of them are totally blameless, guiltless, just normal people. Um, but maybe one or two of them, maybe, uh, was is a key witness in MX, with the downing of MX-17. So we, we've gone to the lengths the best we can to protect their identities. Of course, because this is open source information, by definition, it can be found and accessed by other people. You can reverse search our search process, which, again, we can't prevent that because we work with open source information, but to the best of our ability, um, we've tried to keep these people from being harassed um, or intimidated, maybe, intimidated out of being witnesses, that kind of a thing. Um, because, of course, for the Dutch Lake Joint Investigation and the Criminal Investigation in MH17, protecting witnesses' um, credibility and accessibility is really important. So we've done the best we can to present information that is like obviously real, verifiable. We know, we, you know, we're not just making this up out of thin air, but also walking the fine line between not revealing too much information and getting these people um, disappeared or um, harassed into oblivion. Yeah. Um, on that subject of uh, reverse engineering someone else's open source investigation, uh, just a good example of that is um, Channel 4 News did an investigation into a guy who was posting on Twitter called Sammy Wit uh, Shammy Witness. And he had been, <laughs> yeah. He's uh, well known among a certain community. Basically, for a number of years, he was quite a good source for information on jihadists, and he seemed fairly sane. But after, in a period of about 18 months, he went full on ISIS, basically, and started posting a lot of ISIS propaganda. And uh, this Channel 4 journalist managed to reverse engineer his social media profile's uh, connections to his Facebook page. And um, based on that, he had taken a screenshot of the page and basically blurred out the guy's photograph and name. But because he was able to do it for a, not a difficult process, lots of other people realized that they could do it because there's this whole community of open source investigators who do this kind of informally. So they dug around, and within about an hour of this thing becoming public, they had revealed his real Facebook page. How they did that is because when they blurred out the photograph, he was wearing a very distinct shirt and uh, trouser combination. And it was really obvious, even when it was blurred out, it was the same person. Um, and it turned out to be, I think, an engineer in India, was it? Yes, and, in, in, and um, he got, he's in all sorts of legal trouble, I think. Is he still in legal limbo? I think he might be. But that, basically, he was exposed publicly and arrested in India because uh, journalists at Channel 4 um, didn't really realize that it, his clever sort of open source investigation could be reversed engineered quite easily. So I think you had a question? Yeah, uh, maybe you've already said something about this, but could you say more? And that is the reaction on the, on the Russian side to mm. the uh, sort of reverse engineering, your reverse engineering, and, and, and trying to stop this kind of thing. Well, um, the, 
I mean, there's now a law that's trying to be passed that will ban soldiers from doing this and get them a le- uh, prison term if they do it, I believe, isn't it? Or is it fine? Theoretically. I mean, there's already laws in place, but it's just not enforced. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they're just I trying mean, to strengthen it, yeah. It's the question of enforcing this, because we heard when soldiers were going over to Ukraine from Russia, they were told to hand in their phones, but they had two phones, and they kept one. And then they came. I think even now we see soldiers posting photographs of their 2014 Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, trip to yeah they, they find, they think, because a lot of times these people, start, they, when you sign a contract, you do one or two year, if you're conscripted or contract, you do a one or two year term. And then most of the people who served terms in 2014 are out and living a civilian life. So now they think it's safe to upload their old photo albums from back in their veteran, back now that they're veterans. So we're kind of having a second wave of <laughs> evidence coming to light now. Yeah. But I. I but, but does that. How, how many difficulties does that pose for the kind of continuing uh, stuff that you're trying to figure out? Um, it, it's, it's tough because a lot of times you have a lot of photos emerge um, recently, and it'll you know a lot of times they put a geotag, you know, as in Donetsk or whatever, right? And a lot of times this is where the verification becomes really important because people think that this is some new wave of new aggression, right? Because the summer of 2014 was so hot with. Russian tanks and Russian soldiers and all that stuff. So the hot period is from June 2014 to February 2015. After that, it cooled off a lot. So you see a lot of times these photos emerge, and then people freak out and say, oh, my God, Russia is reinvading Ukraine yet again, whatever. But you, you have to verify, check the time and all that stuff. Um, but a, a, def, a question about um, changing practices, like you mentioned earlier, it's a tough question to answer because it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. So are people posting less photo selfies with tanks because there are fewer people there, or is it because they... W- they got smarter and stopped doing it. So I don't know what the answer is. I think it's probably a combination of both. People, there have been a lot of high-profile cases, um, so people can think in the back of their head, it better not, you know, have a the street like a lot of people, a lot of the Russian soldiers are posing next to Ukrainian street signs, which obviously you can't get more obvious than that. Um, so it's hard to answer if you know there's just there are le- fewer soldiers now than t- 2014, early 2015, but. Um, yeah, it's hard to answer exactly why the reductions happened, but I think it's a combination of both um, changing behaviors, maybe consequences and reprimands from the army, and also um, just a smaller presence in 2017 compared to 2014. I was actually um, at university last week who were uh, looking at this case, and they actually, they've actually they been training AIs to do searches, and they think they could train an AI to search for these kind of soldiers, first by identifying who's a soldier and then training it to look at what unit they're, they're in, and they actually think it would be not that difficult to do, um, you know, quite soon. And if we start moving into a period where you can s- automatically search social networks for anyone who looks like a soldier and all their friends, and figure out their ranks, units, and other details, I think then we will definitely see a reaction from militaries across the, the world from sharing this kind of information. Mm-hmm. So, any more questions? Yeah. Shall we go you and then you? Over there. Yeah. I wonder, did you use Geophidia or Exec to make an investigation as well? This kind of software uh, that uh, allows you to geolocate tweets, uh, tweets and flicks post? Uh, we used uh, Yomapic, which is a site that doesn't work anymore, Rest which searched for VK yes. and Instagram. It was, uh, it was really good because it was free, and we found all kinds of interesting things. My f- I think my favorite was the girlfriend of a soldier who we were looking for this camp. And we knew it was there because in the towns around it, there were lots of drunk Russian soldiers posting all of a sudden. But no one was posting from inside the camp. And the satellite imagery we had didn't show the camp because it wasn't up to date. But one of the soldiers invited his girlfriend into the camp who took lots of geotagged photographs on Instagram, which we could find. And then she like took photos inside tents. I think she took one video that was a scan yeah, of the it, whole area. Yeah, it was area. like a kilometer from... Yeah, the scan, yeah, it was great, yeah. It's better. It's like Google Street View for camps, yeah. <laughs> but it was like one kilometer from the border with uh, Ukraine, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, with... Um, Yom- um, EchoSec is still up, and uh, but you got to pay for it, right? It's, it's, the, it's the most reliable service around now, but it's, it can get pricey unless you have the corporate pricing and you get your boss paid for it. Um, I, as of right now, I don't think that there are any free tools that do uh, contact you or Instagram photos. Geofedia was one. Yamapik was one. There, are, um, there is this one site that did really well. Um, it was like a dating thing. You're just like looking for single guys and girls in your area, but it um, lets you look for. Um, that, uh, but we looked it for soldiers instead. Yeah. So. Um, but right now there aren't any good free alternatives out there, unfortunately. The best option you have is on. Contact, this is a little bit inside baseball stuff, but on contact you try to find um, a photo of the area you're looking for. Like look, just you know, just go to hometown search and go whatever town you're looking for, right? And you find one geotagged photo in a town. And then below there, it says also here, or um, that's just DS, I don't know what it is in Russian. 
Um, it'll say also here, and then you can click and see all the geotag photos in the area um, through Contactio, but there's no, AP, the API is, is being changed. Yeah, so the API doesn't let you do it from the outside, um, except through Ecosec, because they probably paid for it. Um, but off Contactio, you can do a very crude version of that search, but only through the Contactio um, search, but there's no map function. You have to do it kind of by hand. Sorry, one more question. When it comes actually to tools, do you, because you mainly talked about open tools, open source tools, pre ones, do you also use more advanced tools that you develop yourselves and so on? Um, I would say not really. All. No, I mean, we, everything we've done apart from EchoSec, and that's a kind of a development in yeah. the last year, um, are all free tools. Um, yeah. You don't really need a lot of complicated tools. It, it's you more you need, a yeah. good, you need to learn a good range of tools and have a toolbox for each problem rather than just having. I, I often get tech companies coming to me telling them, me they've got the ultimate open source solution and they show me this thing and it just doesn't do any individual thing very well. It does lots of things very yeah, averagely. Yeah. Um, and I think if you're looking at a tool, you're looking for something that does one job really well, like mm -hmm. SunCalc. You know, it's very simple, but if you want to quickly check the position of the sun and tell, you know, shadows, it's that's great. great. It's just knowing the tools that are out there. Yeah, um, I'm very, very suspicious of people who talk about all the open source technology development, because of course there's some cool stuff you can do with you know, researching social media trends and bots and all that stuff, but um, anyone who tells you they've developed the new sort, be very suspicious of them, because 99% um, of the work we do is just through um, our eyes getting red from searching through a million different Google results and contact your pages, right? It's just boring needle and haystack work. So for those videos we are talking about earlier, for every photo or video we found, uh, there was hour, maybe hours of searching. So just for a quick example, one of those convoy videos. So when you, uh, when you take a video on your, like on a camera or whatever, and you upload it, the, deta the default file name is like VID underscore zero six two, you know, then the date, right? And a lot of times when people upload videos on the YouTube or Contactio or whatever, they don't change, they just leave it where the de default file name is, right? So we went through, uh, one of the guys on our team, Iggy, went through, and he looked on every single video taken on a certain day, like the day that we knew the convoy was there, I think the 23rd of June or the 24th of June. He looked at every single video on YouTube, Contactio, and all these social media pages that had that title. There are thousands of results, right? Birthday parties, concerts, whatever. And he found one or two videos that it had like three views, right? No one else had found it, but he found it. There's no tool that can do that, <laughs> um, that can replicate the human eye and human frustration and human <laughs> searching. So this, all this open source stuff, like we try to, through this concert, we're trying to show you some, you know, the very intense stuff, but also the quick things that you can do to do your normal reporting process and verification process. So hopefully you have a good mix of the two. Oh, there's a question there. I suppose it goes without saying that, that, that there's more there's a more rigorous system as system of enforcement. But have you seen or are you aware of militaries of uh, of, of Western governments who might have members who are a bit cavalier online and just in case any other budding mm -hmm, mm -hmm. belling cats are doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, uh, look at do a geotag search of Bagram Air Base, and you find all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful videos. They, it, they they share just as much as anyone else. I mean, you, if you're looking at special forces in any country, they tend not to be shared stuff, but your general soldier will be sharing all the time. Um, so I, I'm sure you could do exactly the same thing we've done here with pretty much any country where there's a lot of social media use. Now, if you're looking at countries, you know, kind of in the MENA region or elsewhere like that where there's less social media use, especially among the young, you probably aren't going to see too much stuff like that. But in um, Europe, I'm sure you would find just endless amounts of information. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's a, uh, a you know, could be a perceived threat, also useful information. Uh, you can see what the soldiers have been up to in their spare time if you're looking for that kind of thing, if they've been a bit too naughty. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely sure you'd find so much information if you looked. Yeah, and a lot of it depends on what uh, what you're looking for. So, for example, if you want to find U.S. Special Forces soldiers in Syria and Iraq, um, you're not going to find it from social media accounts because those people are far too well trained. Just for example, it's a lot harder to find Russian, sol Russian soldiers for social media in Syria for two reasons. One, uh, maybe three reasons. One, maybe they've already learned from Ukraine not to do it. Two, cell phone access in Syria compared to Ukraine, right? Their cell phones work in Ukraine because the same service providers a lot of times, right? Um, and three, the soldiers who are going to find in Syria, both in know, for most militaries are much more specialized, highly trained. They're not 20, they're not 19 year old conscripts like they might be um, in Ukraine. So you have to look at, um, 
what would be the behavior trends? You have to think like like they would. Um, and, but you still get it. So, for example, um, in Turkey, there's a ban against soldiers sharing stuff. But you can still, if you look hard enough, you can still find pictures of um, Turkish soldiers in military bases in Iraq and Kurdi like in Kur like Kurdistan and um, in Iraq and Syria. They're not supposed to do the photos, but they still do it, and there's probably no repercussions for it. So it happens elsewhere. Um, and you know, look at you know, mi like military training exercises. The next military exercise in Finland or Sweden, NATO, whatever. Look, and you'll find soldiers posting stuff. Um, maybe geotag, maybe not, but you can find it if you look. So if there's ever another big war that breaks out, it'll be it won't just be the Russians. It's not a it's a human trait, not a um, national trait. Oh, there's one at the back there. Yeah, I think this is our last question, probably. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll just take, we'll take this question, and then you can just. Given everything you've just been saying about how things have moved on, would you say this investigation was quite exceptional in the sense that you were looking at quite a well-populated area, huge amounts of information put out there? Would you say that if a similar incident happened tomorrow, um, perhaps not in such a populated area, you would have as extensive and as comprehensive uh, an investigation to undertake? Um, I mean, you can see this already at play in um, Syria. So, or, or even Afghanistan. When you look at Afghanistan, we hear about all these wedding po parties that are constantly being bombed by Americans. You never see any photographs or videos of that, or it's very rare. You look at Syria, they're bombing places like Raqqa, which doesn't get much documentation. But when um, the America did bomb a mosque in a rebel-held area, because they've got these networks of kind of social media, even though there's less access, they went out there and they filmed it and they shared the information on sh social media. Um, so it, it, in a way, it, it does depend very heavily on where you're looking. Um, I often have people asking me to look for um, MH370, which disappeared somewhere over the Pacific. And unless, you know, unfortunately, unless there's fishermen on the boat taking lots of selfies, you're not going <laughs> to see anything out there. It's just impossible. I've had people buy satellite imagery of the area, looking at little white specks, trying to figure out what's wreckage and what is waves. But it's just, you know, that won't happen. Um, but it, uh, I mean, there's so much of this information out there. It's just like a compl you're completely spoiled for information if you want to look at certain things. But other things, you're just not going to find much. But yeah. even then... Um, I was doing a workshop recently where um, some people wanted to look at a, uh, a bomb, suicide bombing on an army um, checkpoint. And I generally thought they wouldn't find that much information because Afghanistan is kind of a desert um, through that. But they didn't find social media. They found local media reports. It actually added a lot more information, not because of what they said, because of what they showed. They could figure out the position of the checkpoint. They could see, in fact, this checkpoint was for a bank, which was um, uh, basically it was payday, and this was where they att were attacking. And they'd been attacked in exactly the same way three times or two times previously. So they discovered a new element to the story there, which was that this was a pattern of behavior, and there didn't seem any, to be any adjustment to this pattern of behavior. So these soldiers were being killed in these suicide bombings, um, uh, unfortunately. Um, and I think yeah. we and had one comment from over Are we going to oh. get a comment from there? And real fast, someone. No, no, it's fine. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, and so real fast. I it, well, yeah, so MX-17 is a, is a confluence of a lot of events at once. So there's these pre-established networks, like Elliot's talking about in rebel hell areas in Syria, you these, pre these networks that are already established to share video. Ukraine, the same thing. You had citizen spies, kind of, who were taking, who were taking videos and photos of military convoys. So there was already a pre-established um, expectation, maybe, from because these people were passing information to the R Ukrainian security service, um, and people were they knew they, they were two, three months into this war, so they knew what to look for, and they know which roads to monitor. The, this highway that they took was very, very, very high traffic area. So um, it's kind of a confluence of a lot of events because if this happened a year earlier or a year later, it may not have happened because you don't have those pre-established networks and expectations. And also, um, the Ukrainian war is the first European war fought with the ubiquitous internet, U ubiquitous presence of the internet, right? So you have everyone's cell phones, you can share witness reports, stuff like that. So, yeah, it's, the MX-17 is fairly unique just because it happened um, in a place with high, a lot of eyes watching at the time, a lot of people who were very, back then before everyone left, a lot of people who were very willing to help out the Ukrainian government and try to hamper the separatists or they shared information they were seeing. And also, there's a high internet presence of internet use um, and the ability to capture camera phones or whatever. So, so a lot of things all at once. If one of those things had not been there, we may only have one or two videos and not seven or eight from that day. So. Okay. Yeah, um, thanks very much. Um, and I think we'll move on to the next section now. Thank you. Thank you.